time or the other they may, they may be going out of Pakistan. Don't tell me they don't travel outside. The moment they travel outside, they have to have their bill. You can't say that, okay, when I go out, I'll grow my beard, and when I come to Pakistan, I'll shave it off. It's not possible. It's not right also. And firstly, we are keeping the beard because it's sunnat e It's a recommended sunnat of our beloved Prophet. And I quote from Sahih Bukhari. It's not a first, but recommended sunnat. We are doing to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our beloved Prophet. These are the logical reasons to prove a person who's not merely convinced by the things of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the things of the Prophet. Anyway, I'll let you give you my example. That I had been to Pakistan in 1991. And there when I was staying with my host, there was a gentleman who came. He looked like a Sindhi. So I shook hands with him and he sat. I didn't wish him salam thinking he was a Hindu. He looked like a Sindhi, typical, typical Sindhi look. And afterwards, while I was conversing, I realized he was the owner of the biggest Islamic shop in Pakistan. Imagine. Inshallah, we'll be having the Zohar prayers after the question and session. For the gents, it will be in the auditorium, and for the ladies, it will be on the room on the second floor. Imagine. He was the owner of the biggest Islamic stores in Pakistan, selling Islamic books. Maybe he's selling the books for sahab, whatever it is. But imagine, I mistook him to be a Sindhi. Who's to blame? Who's to blame? Even in Pakistan, even though I agree with you, majority are Muslim, 100% aren't Muslim. They aren't Muslim. Even in the Muslim countries, like Saudi Arabia, like Dubai. Though the citizens, majority are Muslim, there are many outsiders, non-Muslims, who come and work in the city, in the country. Do you know more than 50% of the population of Saudi Arabia and UAE are foreigners? And majority of the foreigners are non-Muslims. So even there, if a person wants to identify, he will have to wear the label. Otherwise, it will not be possible. So if you're having an attire that looks totally like a non-Muslim, but naturally the opposite party will start thinking whether you are a Muslim or not. So irrespective whether staying in a Muslim society or not, I feel you should wear the label. Hope that answers the question, sister. Assalamualaikum. Wa alaikum as uh, Can a Muslim greet salam to a non-Muslim? Sister posed the question that can a Muslim greet salam to a non-Muslim? During the course of my talk, I gave two quotations from the Quran, one stating from Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 54, that a Muslim should wish anyone else who believes in the sign, Assalamu Alaikum. One Muslim should wish another Muslim, Assalamu Alaikum. The second quotation I gave from Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 86 said, that if anyone offers your greeting, greet back more courteously. Or at least the same. Now the sister wants to know, can we greet Assalamu Alaikum to a non-Muslim? And again, there are several Muslims who say, it is haram. You can clearly find in the Quran, that in the Quran it is mentioned, in Surah Maryam, chapter number 17, verse number 47. It's easy to remember, 1947, the year of independence, 1947. Surah Maryam, verse number 47. When Abraham alayhi salam, Abraham, may peace be upon him, when he was taken out from his house by his father, who was a non-Muslim, who was a mushrik, Abraham alayhi salam says, Salamu alayka, may peace be on you. I will pray to my Lord to grant thee forgiveness. Imagine, the Prophet of God, Abraham may peace be upon him. He wished salam to his father who was a mushrik. So when he can wish, why can't we? Again, if you read in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 47, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs Musa alayhi salam and Haun alayhi salam, both are prophets of God Almighty. He instructs them that when you go to Pharaoh and his people, tell them, Salamu Allah, that peace 
beyond those who follow guidance. The same sentence was used by beloved prophet when he wrote letters to the non-Muslim kings. Peace be on you who follow guidance. Again, if you read in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 63, it says that when the ignorant speak to you, say, Kalu Salama, say peace. Quran says, when the ignorant is addressing you, Kalu Salama, say peace on you. Again, if you read in Surah Qasas, chapter number 28, it says, that when you speak with the ignorant, tell them, to you is your deed, to me is my deed. Salamun alaikum, may peace be on you. In no less than four different places of the Quran gives you permission to say peace, to say salam to the non-Muslim. So why is it that some Muslims say that saying salam is haram? Why? You heard very often a particular group of Muslims saying, Salam bolna haram hai. They are referring to a hadith from Sahih Muslim. Volume number 3 in the book of Salam. Chapter number 904. Hadith number 580 to 590. These 11 hadiths are referring to Salam to non-Muslims. The first hadith, hadith number 5380. It says that when asked to beloved Prophet, what should we reply when a Jew wishes us? He said, be on you the same. The second hadith, hadith number 5381 says that when the Jews wish assalamu alaikum, what should they reply? It should be wa alaikum. On you the same. If you quote these two hadiths, you will think, ah, saying, hara, saying salam is haram. That means, it is contradicting with the Quran. Say Muslim, contradicting with the Quran. What are you to do? As I said, analyze the context. Refer to the next hadiths. Immediately the third hadith on Salam. Hadith number 5382 says that when the Jews wish Assalamu Alaikum, meaning may death be on you, say Wa Alaikum on you too. <laughs> Immediately next hadith, hadith number 5383, it says the same thing. Hadith Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, she said that when the Jews wished me, Assamu Alaikum, may peace, may death be on you, she replied, Assamu Alaikum, may death be on you too. And a beloved prophet got angry. He said, don't curse them. Haven't you heard me say, Wa alaikum, on you too. Maybe you make a mistake in hearing them. They may have said, Assalamu alaikum, and you are cursing them. So, if you feel they have said that, only say, Wa alaikum. So that time, the Jews and the Christians, they purposely instigated the Muslims. But naturally, they were Arabs. They knew Arabic as a language. So they wished the Muslim by saying, Assalamu alaikum, may death be on you. Then our beloved Prophet said, Reply by saying, on you too. It's a very good reply. It's not worse. But today, which non-Muslim here in Bombay is telling you, Assalamu Alaikum, who's? Which non-Muslim knows Arabic, unless you make it famous? Who? Quran gives you permission. Hadith is reference to context. If they wish you assalamu alaikum, may death be on you, that time you say that. Who is wishing you death today here? If you don't wish peace with a non-Muslim brother, how? How will he come closer to Islam? Is this what our beloved Prophet taught us? So people quote out of context. They pick up a hadith and quote out of context. They pick up a verse from the Quran. For example, I can show you a verse from the Quran which says that do not pray. If you read the Quran, Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 43, do not pray. It's out of context. The complete context is, do not pray with your mind befogged. Do not pray when you're intoxicated. So don't quote anything out of context. Quote in context, and but natural, surely sister, 
you you are most welcome to wish salam you can wish salam to a non muslim but to a muslim it is compulsory and if anyone wishes the salam you have to reply much in a much better way i hope that answer the question sister uh, brother there is another uh, question related to salam <coughs> Uh, can you wish salam to the opposite sex is chapter 4 verse 86 also applicable in this context because quran prohibits uh, ladies to speak in a voice which is complacent uh, with the non na mehram the question for was that can a lady wish the opposite sex salam or can a gent wish to a lady Assalamu alaikum and if someone wishes should we give a better reply <coughs> and she gave another quotation what she was referring to was from surah azab chapter number 33 verse number 32 she didn't give the quotation but it's from surah azab chapter number 33 verse number 32 it says o prophet tell your wife o wife of the prophet be not too complacent in your speech this was i believe only refers to the wife of the prophet but if the believer would want to follow alhamdulillah it's very good o oh, wives of the prophet be not too complacent in your speech lest the opposite person in whose heart the disease will get diverted means we may start getting ideas therefore wife of the prophet they should not be too sweet ha ha hasna go not too sweet be firm but not too rude also Now the question posed is can a person wish the opposite sex as long as the opposite sex is a mahram for the husband or wife or mahram like son it may be the father etc if it's a mahram very well you have to follow the same same instruction when you see a mahram wish salam if someone wish if a mahram wishes salam wish back more courteously you have to follow same instruction but if the opposite sex is not a mahram the islamic sharia also says you should not speak with the opposite sex unnecessarily but as you find that when you walking on the road every girl you see in burqa you say assalamu alaikum assalamu alaikum this is not what islam says if it's a na mahram unnecessary you should not speak the hi bye you have always hi bye hi bye if it's a necessity for example if support a person phone to his friend and his friend is not at home if he wants to give the message to his wife to the wife of the friend but naturally can speak so assalamu alaikum reply wa alaikum salam and give the message and keep it down with this permission if you speak to a na mahram if it's necessary no problem speak when someone gives a salam it's better not to improve on it give the same give in the same fashion and speak only the necessary sentences don't unnecessary speak ha are you free why don't you come home there is that that you can tell your friend not to his wife only what required islam does not agree in free intermingling of sexes and suppose even if he is a na mahram and if you know him and if he is cheap person then all the more than you should not wish him and sister you will not be going again in the quran if you analyze the words of the quran of surah anam chapter 6 verse 54 it says when those who believe in our signs come wish them salam if the person the cheap person if you know that is immodest he is not a true believer you won't call him a believer so if you don't wish him you won't be going again in the quran you will be following the sharia same way if he wishes you don't reply he is not a believer He has bad intention. The same way, when you wish a nahmaram opposite sex, only if the work is important and if you're speaking, if you start the conversation by wishing, no problem at all. But don't unnecessarily increase the conversation. Hope that answers the question, sister. Jazakallah. Okay. There's a person at the back row who would like to ask a question. Yeah. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Waalaikum assalam. Uh, no, what is the reason behind choosing the red cross as the label for doctors? And can Muslim doctors keep that red cross as their label? if it has any christian origin brother has posed the question that does the red cross what is the origin of red cross what does it signify and does it have any christian origin but if you analyze the cross so the difference between a cross and a plus a cross 
the horizontal bar is much shorter than the vertical bar in the cross. I am referring to the Christian cross. The cross in which they say, they allege that Jesus Christ may peace be upon him was crucified. The horizontal bar is short and the vertical bar is long. It's not equal. The cross sign you have on the doctors, it's a plus sign. Both are equal. So according to my logic, it's not similar. It's different. But in the Muslim countries, for example, if you go in Pakistan, instead of the red cross, they have the crescent. No problem. As long as the people realize there the red crescent is the sign of a doctor. No problem. But I don't consider the plus sign of a doctor to be the same red cross as that of the Christian. Because the Christian cross is of a different shape and the red plus cross sign of the doctor is more, more equivalent to the plus sign you have in mathematics for addition. Hope that. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum My name is Abu Bakr Tahir. I want to ask you a question regarding this uh, keeping the cable. Suppose if you think that if you keep the label, there is a, going to be a prejudice against you. Do you think that you should, uh, in that situation, you should continue to have their label or not? For example, in the France recently, some children were debarred from attending the school because they were wearing the scarf. So in such situation, what Muslims should do? They should continue with their label or not? Please answer the question. Thank you. Brother asked for the question that suppose if you wear the label, it is going to cause problems going to cause prejudice. And he gave the example of France, that some of the ladies, some of the Muslim girls were removed from school because they wore the scarf. So the difference between a farz and a sunnah. Wearing a scarf for a lady, if she's past her age, if she's an elderly lady, if she's an adult lady, it's farz. You have no option for farz. You have to wear it. If it's a young lady, age of six years, seven years, if she does not wear the scarf, no problem. If it's creating problem for that particular time, take it off, no harm at all. If you can find a better school of that same level of education, put in that school which allows you to wear. Doesn't allow you, no problem. But if it's a farz, if it's an elderly lady of the age of 16, 17, if she's going to school or college, if the college says don't wear it, you cannot go against the farz. Surely there will be schools in France and colleges for elderly ladies which allow them to wear. A few don't allow. Here in Bombay also. Few don't allow. There are few non-Muslim schools also which allow the lady to wear the scarf. You'll be shocked. Muslim colleges do not allow. Do you know that? Muslim colleges, if you're keeping a beard and topi, they will tell you to shave off your beard. If you go to a non-Muslim college, they'll allow you. It's a pitiable state. If I give examples, you'll be shocked. In Muslim institutions, 100% trustees are Muslim. If you wish salam, say good morning. This is the situation. We are in a very bad state. It's a state to cry on. If I give examples, people will say that a Malani is an institute. If one of the best Muslim institutes in Bombay, there, the burqa was taken off a lady. They had to fight for it. Imagine. Muslim sir taking out a burqa of another lady in the school, <coughs> in a college, not even a school. It's a pitiable state. So, if it's a farz, like for a lady, if she grows up, farz, no option at all. But if for a child, to your label, no problem at all. Keep it in if you think that's a good school. The moment you come out, wear it. Hope that answers the question. question. Brother, this is a question that was posed to me by a non-Muslim which I couldn't answer, so I would like your aid. Uh, the crescent and the star that we see in the flag, is it a label for a Muslim? Uh, you see in the flag of l many Islamic countries like Pakistan and Turkey or Malaysia. Brother, for the question? No, my question will follow. I just want you to say, is it a label? Uh, Can you complete Islamic the question? I'll give the answer. Yeah. If it is an Islamic label, then they say the crescent and the star are not scientifically placed. It's a wrong label. Okay. The brother posed the question that is it a label for Islam as such? And if it's there, it's not scientifically placed. It's too close. It should be it should much be further apart. Here the first part is it an Islamic label? Nowhere in the Quran it's mentioned that use the star or the moon. Uh, the word Najam is mentioned, the star. And the word Kamar is mentioned. 
These are signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Quran says the star is a sign, the moon is a star, is a sign. Even the sun is a sign. You know, various signs. I agree some people want to put the star, I've got no objection. But Quran says that, I've not come across. And if they keep, is it, it's not scientifically placed. I do agree. The star normally should be far away. If it's too far away, then the logo will not be visible. If they want to have a small stamp, if it's close, you can see both of them. If you keep it up far away, in that small stamp, the moon will be a minute dot and the star will be a minute dot. So, I feel they're illogical. When we have any logo, it's a calligraphy. It's symbolic. No Muslim says that this star and the moon are placed like that only. Suppose I have a logo, IRF. Hey, you English not English. What is it? What is it? What is IRF people don't know English. What is it? What is it? It's not R. This is a logo. Symbolic. For Islamic Research Foundation. We know English very well, Alhamdulillah. After I come J. H-I-J. So, you, you should do Hikmah. Hikmah. So this star is kept. Star is the sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Moon is the sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We aren't placing it the way you see it always. And if he knows signs better, non-Muslim, it always keeps on changing. The evening star and the moon is never in the same position always. It always keeps on changing. So you'll have to have 365 signs. If on Monday, we have a new flag. On Tuesday, another flag. It's illogical. Why we use the moon, I'll tell you. Because we Muslims follow the lunar calendar. We Muslims follow the lunar calendar. The Christians. They follow the solar calendar. That's the reason we say, okay, we want to keep moon as a symbol. Alhamdulillah. Even the sun is the sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the shams, even the moon. But since we follow the lunar calendar, the paper keeping the crescent. And each kachan is a significant. The new moon, therefore new moon is the signature. I mean, it's the sign. Again, the same moon you see on the flag is not exactly like a new moon. It is said to be a new moon, but it is quite big. Hope that answers the question. Any questions from the lady section? Yes. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as Just as uh, you said for a male, if he has to go to office and uh, he works in a un-Islamic, uh, under the un-Islamic boss, and he can remove his cap and keep it in his pocket and wa wear it when he goes out, is it possible for a woman also if she has to work in that sort of an atmosphere to hmm. take her nakab and work, uh, take her nakab out and work, especially in our uh, type of society, uh, uh, getting a job for a Muslim woman? Wearing a niqab and following the Islamic rules is not possible, especially when she is educated from that sort of a background. This is another question that I said during my talk that if the label of trucks, like a cap, keep you in a pocket, can the woman do the same? Can she take out a niqab? I told you, sister, there's something like fard, something which is sunnat. If the cap is the label, to wear a cap but for a lady if she's elderly it is somewhat similar answer which which I'd given earlier if it's a lady if she's of matured age it is compulsory that she wears the complete hijab her head should be covered she can't take out her head covering in front of any nahmeram you said how can a Muslim woman work my first question is why should she work in Islam the financial burden, the lodging, boarding, clothing, and all financial aspects of a woman before she's married is laid on the shoulders of the father and the brother. After she's married, it's laid on the shoulders of the husband and the son. In Islam, a woman need not work for a living. She doesn't have to work. But if the position is bad, if there are financial problems with the permission of the husband, she can work in an Islamic atmosphere. The best atmosphere is where there is segregation of sexes. Go to a factory in which there is different department for ladies and for gents. There you can take out your scarf, no objection. You can very well take out your scarf in an atmosphere which is only of ladies. Quran gives you the permission. But don't work in a mixed atmosphere. With your hijab or without your hijab. Avoid it. Don't work in a mixed atmosphere. If you're forced in the circumstances, 
then maintain your hijab and see so do not transgress any limit of the sharia it is not your job to earn your living sister it's the job of your father and your brother before you get married and it's the job of your husband and your son after marriage to look after your financial aspect hope that answers the question yes brother if a believer assalam alaikum and due to some reason deliberately he does not reply me back should i continue wishing him or should i stop wishing him because deliberately he does not reply me back brother has asked the question that if he wishes a muslim and if the non muslim does not reply deliberately sorry for a muslim a muslim does not reply deliberately that means i told you he sometimes wish salam and maybe your muslim brother has not heard you so have to repeat it just say i wish to salam so then oh i'm sorry i did not hear you and he replies but this question is the brother spoke the deliberately that muslim is not wishing you back what do you do brother you have done your job you have followed the verse of the quran from surah anam chapter 6 verse 54 if the muslim after hearing does not reply he is not following the verse of the quran from surah nisa chapter 4 verse 86 he is going against the guidance of the quran it's not your problem it's his problem why is not wishing you don't have to waste your time on him you wish him if you have a doubt he has not heard he has not heard you repeat it but if you know that surely he has heard you and is not replying you don't bother but next time when you meet him again you wish him you say okay last time he didn't wish me therefore i won't wish him today that's wrong you follow the quran it's his job whether he follows or not if possible quote him brother you are not following the quran surah nisa chapter 4 verse 86 if you want to follow fine if you don't want to follow, don't follow i have done my job i have given you the message now it's up to you whether you want to reply or not hope that answers the question any question from the lady section yes, yes please uh, brother assalam alaikum wa alaikum assalam uh, will we get uh, the labels that you showed or uh, if you can lend us for a day or two uh, i think i can uh, get printed from some printer they are very good labels so sir that's a question that she like the label very much regarding the sticker which is mentioned from the quran al quran the last and final revelation of god this surely as i promise every one of the available here can take a sample either they want the front sticker or the back sticker since the stickers are limited you can't have two one inshallah everyone would have if the extra then you can take a second one but the guy in the other sticker sister these stickers have been imported from abroad from london and usa these are my sample sister and normally whatever samples i have i see to that that i don't give out not that i want to be like a cobra sitting on it many times i gave many books of mine it has never come back I don't distrust you sister you will surely inshallah give it back but as a rule whatever I have a single copy and if it's precious inshallah we are thinking of reproducing it what you can do is you can note down it is very easy you can note down the wording surely you can have these labels for a few minutes in the office i have office note down the content there's nothing which is fancy about it they are plain universal type style If you want to know the size, you can measure the size also. It's plain English, so it will not do you any benefit if you take it for one day. How the words are important; they are chosen very well. You can surely write down these words in your diary or on a piece of paper and have them printed, and surely give us a few sample copies. And if it's cheap, then we would also like to place an order. Uh, brother can you please repeat the quotation that you gave from the quran where the where the word beard has been mentioned and can you please explain the context brother for the question that he wants me to give he wants me to give the reference again of where i mentioned the word beard and he wants to give the context <coughs> the word beard is only mentioned once in the quran as i said it's mentioned surah taha chapter number 20 verse number 94 which says that kala he said how alaihi salam that o son of my 
mother, that means my brother, don't seize me by my beard or by the hair on the head. We are in the context, brother. Here is the Quran. This is a translation by Allama Abdullah Yusuf Ali. Whatever, anytime, whenever you hear any speech, whenever you hear any scholar or learned person quoting, always check it up. If he has not given the reference, at the end of the talk, ask him, please may I have the reference? I said Surah Taha. If you forgot the chapter number, normally I even give the chapter number in my talk. If you don't know the chapter number, look in the index. Under T, Surah Taha, T-A-H-A, T-A-H-A. And the T will be mentioned, chapter number 20. Chapter number 20 is very easy to find because every page is numbered. Now, in the index, whatever you want, you get it. You want marriage? Look under M. You want divorce? Look under D. Abdullah Yusuf Ali, especially this translation, <coughs> has got a very beautiful index, a very concise index. It's not possible for normal human beings like us to remember where is what. So, if you want to know, look in the index at your fingertips. This copy of the Holy Quran has been imported from abroad. As the chairman said, the hadiyah is only 150 rupees. Believe me, this is a foreign print. The paper is Bible paper. That is the quality of paper. Thin paper, about 2,000 pages, only for 150 rupees. You will never find a book, a foreign book, with hard cover, hard cover with 2,000 pages for so less a price. It's impossible. You'll never find such a book, foreign print, 2,000 pages with hard cover for 150 rupees. In the foreign book stall, which also subsidized, it cost about 600 to 800 rupees. And this Quran has got a beautiful language. If you read it, it even improves your language. Now you said, what was the context? I said, Surah Taha. So open chapter number 20. I said, verse number 94. Then look up. Verse number 94. And maybe the speaker did not expound. And I didn't expound on that. Since I thought it was not necessary, I didn't expound on it. If you want to know, go home and check up. But since you asked me the question, and since fortunately I know about it, the context starts from Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 83 to 98. Musa alayhi salam, when he went on Mount Sinai for 40 days, afterwards, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him that your people have been led astray by the summary. The summary has led your people astray. They have not kept their promise. Summary may be a proper noun for a person. In Egyptian language, it is referred to as a foreigner. In Hebrew, as a watchman. It can be a proper noun, it can be a foreigner, it can be a watchman, whatever it is. The Arabic word is summary. But the summary led them astray. When Musa Ali comes, when Moses, may peace be upon him, Musa Ali Salam, when he comes down from Mount Sinai, he gets angry on his people. He says that, did you not have trust on the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or did you think it was too long? Or did you want to face the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So the people say, the ornaments that we were wearing, they were too heavy. Therefore, we threw them into the fire on the instruction of the summary. And the summary took out a golden calf from the fire. But when the calf came out, they realized it could not speak. And Harun al Salam, when they were doing these things, he tells them that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing you. Don't go astray from the path and follow me. So Musa alayhi salam, when he comes down, he gets angry at the deed which his people have done. And he even gets angry on his brother. And may peace be upon him. He says, couldn't you have gotten in the right path? This is the time when Harun alayhi salam quotes this word. That, oh my brother, don't seize me by my beard or by the hair of my head. I did warn them. 
and I tried not to make division in the children of Israel. In the context, you'll find the three reference to context. The same story is mentioned in Surah Araf, chapter number 7, and there you get another commentary from verse number 142 to verse number 151. Verse number 142 again says that when Musa alayhi salam went to the mountain, the same story is repeated with the omission of few points and with the addition of few points. Same story. Musa alayhi salam went on Mount Sinai, went for 40 days, and then he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I want to see you face to face. I want to see you, O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says, you cannot see me directly. But look at what happens to the mountain when I show my grace on the mountain. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is verse number 143, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows his grace on the mountain, the mountain falls down to dust. Musa alayhi salam, only looking at the mountain, he faints. And when he regains consciousness, he says, Glory be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because no human being can see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly. And live, at least in this life you cannot. And the verse continues, as he comes to know that his people have been astray, he comes down. When he comes down, here he gets angry, and he holds Haun alayhi salam, and may peace be upon him, by the hair of his head, and drags him. So the Aaron may peace be upon him, say, that why do you do this to me? You are making the other people, the Israelites, to rejoice. I had warned them. They were on the verge of slaying me. Then Musa alayhi salam says, and he prays to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that forgive me and my brother. So this, for any context, whenever any speaker quotes, look up in the index, look up in the commentary, and don't look up thinking that maybe the He's pulling a fast one. Not that the speaker is pulling a fast one, because the moment you look up yourself, it becomes part of a memory. Tomorrow even you can start quoting. Chapter number so and so, verse number so and so. So make it a habit after every lecture. Go home and check and read. So it will become part of a memory. And inshallah, as the Dua mentioned, Rabbi Zidni Ilman. Oh my Lord, increase me knowledge. Again, this is mentioned in Surah Taha. Chapter number 20, verse number 140. Hope that answers the question, brother. Any question from the ladies' side? Because we have a few brothers who would like to ask questions over here. Uh, the, a sister was already asked, can she ask? No, I would prefer giving preference to those gents over here who have not yet asked a question. Okay, okay. Assalamu alaikum, brother. Wa alaikum assalam. Label, brother. It's doing the right, it occurs, right. Sorry? Doing the right, communal rights. So you're the first, first person to be assaulted or killed on the road or a bus or a train. So there is no lines to an ordinary take a label and be mingled with the crowd. Brother has given a very good example that doing right, if you wear the label, you will be the first person to be identified. And you may be killed. So isn't it, isn't it better to remove the label and get mingled? I do agree with you. Under certain circumstances, there are always exceptions to the rules. <coughs> For example, if you read in the Quran, in four places, in Surah, in Surah Bakra, chapter number two, Verse number 173, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 3, in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 145, and in Surah Nahel, chapter number 16, verse number 115, it says, Hurrimat alaykumul, maitudu waddamu wa lahmil kinzir, wa ma'uhu illa li gayr illa bi. That's forbidden for you for food, ah, dead meat, blood, the flesh of swine, and any food on which has been invoked the name of anyone besides Allah. These four types of food are forbidden for you. But immediately in the same verse, in all the four verses, in Surah Baqarah chapter 2, verse number 173, in Surah Maida chapter number 5, verse number 3, in Surah Anam chapter number 6, verse number 145, and in Surah Nahal chapter number 16, verse number 115, it says that if under necessity, if, if under compulsion, if you willfully, if you willingly do not disobey God, willingly on doing it, Unwillingly are disobeying God. Willingly, if you do not disobey God, Allah will not hold you guilty. For it's all forgiving and most merciful. But do not transgress limits. So if in a right, if the problem is there, you can be identified and it will cause a loss to your life. Quran gives permission that someone puts a gun on your head and say, Are you a Muslim or a Hindu? You can very well say you are a Hindu. Quran gives you permission. Even the hadith will give you permission. 
हम तो शहीद नहीं फाइन इफ दू दर 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 प्रॉब्लम बट आई एज अ पर्सन सपोज सम राउंड द कॉर्नर द नो वन इज लुकिंग एट मी इफ यू पुट ऑन मी डूइंग दैट आई एम मुस्लिम और हिंदू एंड इफ आई नो दैट इफ आई से आई आई एम मुस्लिम आई गेट किल्ड सिंस कुरान गिव मी परमिशन आई एम हिंदू बट द सेम पर्सन इफ इन फ्रंट ऑफ टेन लैक्स पीपल टेल मी He puts a gun on my forehead and say, "I am Muslim or Hindu." Still, Quran gives me permission. I can say I'm a Hindu, but they are prefer saying I'm a Muslim because I'm setting an example to 10 lakh people. So, depend upon the situation. Quran, in all situation where there's a danger to your life, if you're going to die out of hunger, pork becomes halal for you. Alcohol becomes halal for you. If the label you're wearing, whatever act you're doing, if it's a fard also, if it's causing a danger to you, you can very well abstain from it. Until the difficulty passes away. If you are sick, you need not pray. Same way, in the right, even if you shave your beard, insha Allah, Allah will not hold you responsible. Like I said, when you go to the office, take out the label, put it in a cap. But when you come out, you have got no excuse. Now the rights are over. You have got no excuse. Salaam, brother. Wa alaikumussalam. Ah, uh, we are talk about beard and the cap. Uh, some people wear cap and some people wear turban. Uh, can you tell me uh, it is necessary to wear cap and turban simultaneously? But uh, the question that some people wear cap, some people wear turban. Which is more better? Is it necessary to wear both? The hadith which I quoted, it is another mokada for a cap. I mean for for a beard, not for a cap. I didn't quote any hadith saying for the cap, but there are hadiths, not of the cap. If you read Sahih Bukhari, volume number seven, book of verses. Chapter number sixteen. It says that a beloved prophet wore a turban. Next chapter, chapter number seventeen says a beloved prophet at a time wore a helmet. Sometimes he may wear a helmet, sometimes a cap, and maybe a turban. Fine, but beard he always had. So beard is not a mokada. Cap it is or not? It's a label acceptable, accepted by the full world. Why don't you change the label? If you say okay, everyone should wear a badge. So we are going to change. I will take a voting. And will you wear a badge of Allah like that? Difficult. So, thing which is already accepted, it's a very good label. Continue with it. First is the beard. Second is the cap. Alhamdulillah. If you want to wear a turban, no problem. But the beard is, is there. It is only the mokada. Hope that answers the question. Brother, at the back, he's not asked a question. You have showed some games. Will you please tell us from where we can get these things? Yes. Brother wants to know that I've shown some games. Where I've acquired them from? They are acquired from different parts of the world, the world, brother. The one I should test, the chapter paradise. It's available in UK as well as USA. The snakes and ladder is from Islamic Foundation Leicester. That's in UK. The jigsaw puzzle, some are from USA, some are from South Africa. Regarding the exciting game of quiz. That from Durban, South Africa. These labels, these labels are available in UK as well as in USA. In UK, we go to Central Mosque. We go to Central Mosque, the biggest, biggest region, speak region, Park Mosque. We we'll get these labels there. And all these have been got from various cities. Everything I'm not remember, but surely the address is given behind every game. Yes, in India, it's difficult, brother. Unless someone gets an idea of reproducing it, I have it in mind. But the other priorities, Inshallah, we'll be starting a special children wing. We have started a ladies' wing. When we shift to the new premises downstairs, the top second floor office will be only for children and ladies. And there, when we start the children's wing, we, Alhamdulillah, have enough material to start a children's wing. We have got books. Right from KG to standard ten, what to teach them about Islam? We have got the syllabus of the Islamic schools in America, in uh, in South Africa, in London, from various parts of the world. We have got sample copies of all the various books for Islamic schools. We have got jigsaw puzzles. We have got audio cassettes. We have got video cassettes. We have got computers. Inshallah, pray that everything settles fast. When we shift down to the new premises, the top premises will be only for ladies and children. Full time, inshallah. Or maybe initially we'll have half a day, then full day, depending upon the response. Now we are busy doing some other work. We are busy expanding Islamic Foundation. 
the moment that is settled, inshallah, we will try and reproduce all these in bulk. For you to purchase, it will be expensive now, brother. Each thing. Therefore, I didn't tell the price of everything. Everything is expensive there. So, neither do I want to quote the price of these. In, in Bombay, you can get for 2 3 rupees. There it costs a lot. It costs in dollars and pounds. So, inshallah, we will reproduce all these things. Inshallah, if not soon, then later on. Most of these things. And the games which are easy to reproduce, that already, inshallah, will produce and we'll also create a demand for that, inshallah. Any question from the ladies section? Oh uh, yeah, uh, sisters who have already asked, can I ask? Yes. Uh, brother, normally we see that uh, Muslim girls, they wear, uh, they don't have any scruples in wearing bindis, you know, tikas. Normally I see in the colleges. But when I try to argue with them, they say that wearing bindi is not attributed to the uh, Hindu script or uh, Hindu religion. It is a more of an Indian custom. So as also the Mangal Sutra and the Indians, are like saris also. And then they say, uh, you see the intention, like, the intention is not to be identified as a Hindu lady, but it is to be for aesthetic, aesthetic sense, for as a cosmetic they use. So, could, can you give me a quotation in the Quran where we can just argue with them that there, uh, we should not be identified as uh, those religions or, uh, you know. She has posed the question. She has posed several sub-questions in the question. She said that if a lady puts the bindi, point number one, or wears the Mangal Sutra or a Sari, three things she said, how will we convince them not to wear? Because they say these are not the signs of a Hindu. You say it is sign, they are saying it is not. The best way is what they are is to agree with them and then prove them wrong. So you ask them, why do you wear a bindi? And you give the answer. And you give the answer for aesthetic sense. So say, the Quran says, display not your beauty and ornament except for that nature of. Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 31. Do not display what that nature of. The moment you put lipstick or put a bindi, if it's not a sign of the other religion, you're doing it for beauty. Quran prohibits that directly. In Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 31. Whatever makeup you put to beautify yourself, it's not allowed in Islam. Coming to the second part, Mangal Sutra, I've already answered. The third question about sari. Is sari allowed or not? So normally what the Indian ladies wear sari, on a normal basis, it's not allowed. Because of the way they wear it. But I know of many Muslim ladies who wear it in an Islamic way, which is allowed. If you wear a sari, which has a blouse, your wrist, full sleeve blouse. And the blouse covers the complete body, not that a middle part of your body is seen. Your stomach should not be seen. Normally when the Indian ladies they wear the sari, the stomach is seen. If your stomach is covered by the blouse and complete body and the pallo is taken on the head, you should see to it that not any part of the hair, no hair is seen. If you take precaution, wear a full sleeve blouse, see that stomach is not seen. If you wear a sari, which is not tightly wound, Sari, as well as the pallo, it's been taken on the head. In where no hair is seen, it's perfectly Islamic, sister. But if you wear a sari in which the stomach is seen, you are going against the six criteria I mentioned, which mentioned the Sahih Hadiths. Hope that answers the question, sister. This is the last and final question. Any question from the gen side? <laughs> Brother, in the Quran, Allah has given us the whole list of halal things, haram things, and the first thing. So if this label is so important, why no mention is made, made like that? Any criteria, reason? As the brother has said, that Allah has given in the Quran of certain halal things and haram things. Why isn't, if the label is so important, why isn't it given? If you analyze, brother, in the talk I said, I quoted several words, more than 10 places. Asyu Allah, Asyu Rasul. Follow Allah and follow Rasul. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in about 700 places, it says, that you should pray, you should pray. The basics of prayer is given. Where to keep your hand is not given. Allah says, look at the Prophet. Isn't prayer important? Prayer is one of the important pillars of Islam. How to pray? Look at the Prophet. The main first, Qayyam, Ruku, Sujit is given. Other details, look at the Prophet. Wudu, the main four parts are given. Other details, look at the Prophet. Same way. I'm not saying cap and, and, and the beard is the first. It's not a fard. I made it very clear. It's a sunnat e the beard. The Prophet said that. It's not a fard. There are various sunnat. Some are sunnat e some are sunnat e some which the Prophet did, but did not ask the others to do. 
So in that way, if you want to follow the Quran completely, you also have to know the lifestyle of beloved Prophet and what things he recommended. But unfortunately, there are Muslims which make life difficult for us. They quote out of context, they quote Mawzu Hadith, they quote Zaif Hadith, and they make life difficult. Imagine, believe me, being a Muslim is, alhamdulillah, easy. If you are not on the right track, if your bad intention is very difficult, but if you are a clean-hearted person, being a Muslim is easy. People make life difficult. Aisa kana jai, Aisa kana jai, fine. There are many things the Prophet said, if you do it, fine. But some people make it a fart on you. You should do like that, you should wear like that, you should do like that, you should sit like that, you should stand like that, you should do like that, making life difficult for you. And when you ask the reference, no one gives. Believe me, no one gives. I have asked several Muslims to say about the Izar, no one has given me a single reference so far. Finally, I had to do my homework. I had to search, 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 and I found the answer in Sahih Bukhari. Various other things I can quote. I don't want to go into that. So, the basics. The basic fard, haram and halal are given in the Quran. Some things are makru. For example, about food also. The basics are given in the Quran. Red meat. The flesh of swine. Anything on which is invoked any name of Allah. Blood. I have to talk Basic five things are given in the Quran. Other things, also makru. Or good haram. Like eating the meat of canine. Meat of canine animals. Not given in the Quran. So you have to refer to the hadith. But refer to authentic sources. Then inshallah you'll find that following Islam is not difficult. But if people tell you there are hundreds things you have to follow, so you'll say there are hundreds. What do you love doing them? If you know there are only five, six basic things or a few things, you can very well strive to follow those. But people make life difficult for you saying, thousand sunnah there. Thousand sunnah there more I have to follow. Do this like that, do this like that, do this like that. Many things, it's left to you optional. So if you analyze and do a research, you'll find out that it's very easy to follow Islam. Hope that answers the question. Uh, yes. One, one more question. That is regarding circumcision. So the person uh, that non-Muslim we convert to Islam, is it compulsory on, the, on our part to make him uh, circumcised or not? And also, what is the age at, at which the child should be circumcised? And the, there is only compulsory rules uh, seen in Quran. And hadith also, I don't, uh, I don't, I not seen so far, but only there is a injection that we had to follow uh, Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam and it has been revealed that Prophet Ibrahim and the other prophets till Jesus uh, alayhi salam their followers also are having circumcision so please uh, enlighten on, on this more and though this is not a question on the topic since this is the last and final question if there's any other brother over here who would like to ask a question I'll permit it otherwise I'll say it's not permissible any other question from the brother's side Okay. My pleasure to ask the question. To answer the question, the brother posed the question that it is important that non-Muslim when they convert, is it compulsory they should be circumcised? Is it mentioned in the Quran or the Hadith? And the brother gave his answer very well. That I do agree that nowhere the Quran directly says that it is compulsory, but he has rightly said that the reference to the Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam that he was circumcised, and but as the Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, it was a custom and the right thing. It's a sunnah of the messenger. Abraham may peace be upon him, and we should do it. It's a sunnah de mokada. It's a recommended sunnah. Fine. Is it compulsory? <coughs> Since it's a sunnah, it's not compulsory. But how you convince? How you convince to a non-Muslim that you should be circumcised? There are several medical benefits you can give to a non-Muslim regarding circumcision. That, firstly, that if you're circumcised, if you're circumcised you have very little chances of having can cancer of the penis, carcinoma of the penis. A person who is circumcised does not have a chance of having cancer of the penis. All those who are not circumcised, they may have cancer. Not they will have, they may have. There are several diseases, paranthropostitis, and several diseases which are prevented if you are circumcised. Besides that, it's a hygienic practice. But when you are circumcised, you remove the false skin. You remove the prefuse. And if the foreskin is not, not there, if it's removed, after you go for call of nature, after you go for call of nature, or after you have an intercourse, the remains of urine is not there. It's hygienic. If the urine remains, it can cause itchiness. It can cause disease of the skin of the penis. Several benefits. 
several benefits. Besides that, even recent researches have shown that those people who are circumcised, they have less chances of having AIDS. Less chances. Not that they will not have, less chance of having AIDS. Those who are circumcised, they enjoy sex more than those who are not circumcised. That's the reason today, more than 50% of the children in America, they are circumcised. The moment a child is born in America, the doctor poses a question to the parent, do you want the child to be circumcised? The doctor is not bothered about the Quran and the Sunnah, because there are medical benefits. Therefore, you can easily convince a non-Muslim that circumcision is better. Regarding what time it should be circumcised, actually there is no specified time. But, if you read, if you want to convince a Christian circumcision, you can say, that is mentioned in the Bible, that Jesus Christ may peace be upon him, he was circumcised on the eighth day. He was circumcised. So when Jesus Christ was circumcised, why aren't you circumcised? The Bible says that. Again, if you read in the Hadiths, some people say third day, some people seven days, some say eight, some say before first week, some say before forty days, various things. Preferably, we do the Akika and the circumcision on the seventh day. Preferably. It's not, but it should be done in the young age. It's better. Preferable. Not seven, can be thirty days, can be forty days, whatever it is. Preferable at a young age. It's better, the healing is quicker, even medically. If you circumcise a child at a young age, the healing is quicker, he has less complications. Hope that answers the question. Bakhrit down, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. All praise is only due to Allah Ta'ala, the Lord, Cherisher, and Sustainer of the worlds. Let us first express our thanks and gratitude to our Creator Allah Ta'ala for having granted us the topic to have assembled over here and spend time in discussing Islamic issues. May Allah Ta'ala give us the courage and uh, the desire and sincerity to put in practice whatever we may have discussed today. I would like to express my thanks to all of you who have spent so much time with us and have taken the trouble of coming over here and spending time and discussing issues with us. Our thanks also to Dr. Zakir Naik for having taken us all the efforts to put the subject into correct perspective. I'd like to announce a few things. Firstly, all those of you who have come here for the first time to the Islamic Research Foundation, you are requested to fill up this response data card which is kept over here on the counter. So before you leave, kindly fill up the response card. Secondly, we'll be having the Zuhar prayers in, by Jamaat or congregation over here in this hall itself after we wind up today. And uh, next Sunday, inshallah, we'll be having a quiz on the Quran. This quiz will be very simple. And people who attempt the questions, whether they give the correct answer or not, any person who attempts a quiz question on Sunday next will be given a small booklet which is, is it not necessary to read the Quran with understanding? This quiz will commence at quarter to eleven sharp. So all of you are requested, please come for the quiz. It will only benefit you to gain more knowledge and learn much more about the Quran, which is the last and final revelation of Allah Ta'ala. A person who answers correctly the first question that he attempts, if he answers it correctly, he gets this Quran, which is an imported copy. It's only in Arabic. Any person who gives the right answer for the first time, he gets this. There are several other gifts which are given. The person who gets the most points in this quiz will be given a video cassette, which is a lecture by Dr. Zakir Naik on uh, should the Quran be read with understanding. On Saturday, which is the 3rd of June, next week, in the afternoon at quarter to three, we have Brother Zaid Patel. He is giving a lecture, a talk on should the Quran be read with meaning. Should the Quran be read with meaning? We would also like to inform you that on Saturday after the lecture, we will be having a question answer session. On Sunday, we are having the quiz which I have spoken to you about. And on Monday, inshallah, in the afternoon, there is a session only for ladies in the afternoon. With these words, I would like to thank all of you who have assembled over here. Any person interested in taking one such sticker, which is kept over here on the counter, may kindly avail of it. Please assemble for the Zohar prayers, and also make sure that those of you who have come here for the first time, fill up the response card. Thank you very much. Wa alhamdulillah rabbil